Hey, so I'm starting up my YouTube channel again with some different kind of stuff. Uh, this video is going to be talking about how I'm using keyboard drums since not being able to play real drums because of my injuries. So if you want to have a look at actually what I'm doing technically wise, then you can click on a link somewhere in the frame right now. Or alternatively, you can stick with me and uh, check out my little story about why why this is a thing and really what happened to me, what my injuries truly are. And then we can have a little look at the software and uh, see how I do what I do, how this stuff really works. So here's the story time of uh, exactly what happened to me and why I am uh, why I am as messed up as I am. So back in 2013 when I uh, had to take a year out because of my shoulder tendon tearing injury, I had an underlying hip injury that wasn't addressed and I didn't really think about it. I just kind of healed the shoulder and then just kept playing and uh, that as it turns out is a big mistake because I actually had a problem going on with my hip socket. It looks like, I'm not sure whether or not I tore a labrum in my hip then or if I just had really bad tendinopathy. It didn't actually re-engage my core, um, no, I didn't really see anyone about personal training, I just was like yeah I can drum again, awesome, but actually I had a very weak core, very weak glutes and that meant my uh, my hip sockets were a bit unstable. A lot of people can get away with that. Not me, because I've got this thing called uh, femoroacetabular impingement that's happened. I know that's a bit of a long word, but basically it's where the hip socket, the hip, the like, that's the leg. This is my leg. This is the, you know, the head of the femur, the ball, the socket joint. Um, basically, that impingement happened because the head of the femur was a little bit too big on one side. It's called cam, cam-shaped impingement. So that's how I was born. You can basically multiply a few elements. You take the problem that you might have genetically in the shape of your ball and socket joint, you know, where it's gone wrong, you kind of multiply that by how much you're working it versus how unstable the joint is. And roughly then at some point, based on how bad those individual elements are, you're going to get yourself um, problems, basically. And that's what happened to me. I played too much with it, you know, too often with uh, an, an underlying injury with an unstable thing and, and basically I did a whole bunch of stuff really awesome stuff last year you know in May I was at Middle Farm Studios recording with Nolly uh, and Adam Nolly Get Good as the producer for a guy called uh, Gavin Kennedy and that was an awesome session but I went back to back straight from that into a show in Poland where I played again with uh, my old bandmate ex-bandmate John Brown with his project Flux Conduct which was an awesome experience but it was, you know, then it was very much back to back. I then went straight out on the road playing for David Maximicic and Nick Johnston, double duty, both supporting animals as leaders. Okay, yes, this was only a six day tour, but, uh, you know, six days of touring with, you know, playing two sets a night with underlying things going on. I remember midway through that tour, I think I was in Harlem when I realized that I uh, was having a bit of trouble walking, like I just was losing the ability to stand. Uh, it felt like I just had to fall over, like, and that was um, really bad sciatica caused by like muscles all kind of being overworked. And um, the long and short of it is, is that this, the muscles that hold up the spine are actually doing the kick work for me because as one muscle stops working properly or a damage in one area, other muscles pick up the slack and all the muscles basically that were meant to be just keeping my spine in alignment, they were starting to actually do the work because everything else was so screwed. So, you know, I pushed them too far and they then my spine just kind of collapsed and it trapped my sciatic nerve, meaning I couldn't walk, which was awful. And so that started happening about a week before TechFest. This is TechFest 2017, you know what we're talking about. And um, yeah, then I actually got to TechFest the day after the London show, which was the last show of the Animals as Leaders tour. I drove the day afterwards to go for an early morning rehearsal with Novena, who I was playing for. And that rehearsal went fine. And I felt already, you know, I had one day off, one day of rest. I was camping, but I had my like temper mattress with me. I thought I was taking care of myself. But in that day off, everything shut down just I couldn't walk it, it basically like you give the body like a bit of time to rest after a lot a lot of work and uh, it will fall apart and here I am I'm at tech fest hired by Novena and by my friend Maxi Carno to play his stem set both at tech fest first stem then Novena and I can't walk and it's just like oh what the hell do I do so I've practiced keyboard drums before 
Thankfully, I was a pianist before I was ever a drummer, so the piano has kept me going a lot. Um, and <laughs> what happened was I managed to find a whole variety of musicians who really, really helped me out. So Joel Pinder from Fractions actually hooked me up with a keyboard, and a bunch of other people, including Matt Ball from Nicosia, uh, just a bunch of real sweethearts, they all helped me over these couple of days to put together a keyboard drumming rig. Essentially, you know, that was... It was a crazy setup. We had to come up with it in like next to no time. The real challenge was I've never played this stuff on a keyboard drum kit before. So having practiced that kind of keyboard drums a lot, you know, in messing around, that really came in handy then. Um, but yeah, I I found that I could actually get through the gigs. Uh, there's got a little bit of random footage that I found trawling about the internet here. You can have a look at. <laughs> So it's a little bit ridiculous, but you know, got through it. The show must go on. A couple of months afterwards, I did a bit more touring and it fell apart again. So I just stopped and I haven't played since October last year. I'm st I've just had surgery uh, to fix the misshaping and the labral tears and all that stuff. And uh, that's on the left side. So my right side's the same shape as it always used to be. That I'll just have to keep strong and make sure that doesn't go wrong again. Uh, then that way I'll never need to have surgery on my right side. But um, the left side, you know, I won't be able to get back on the kit properly for like half to a whole year more. So all that time, I can still make music, I can still write music, I could probably still perform if people actually wanted to have this on stage. I think it's quite fun. Um, it's a bit gimmicky, obviously everyone wants a drummer actually playing, but you know, if anyone actually wanted to have me play this kind of setup, I could totally do it, I think. I'm going to talk a bit about now the uh, the software, the hardware, the kind of general techie stuff and, you know, how all that stuff works. So, uh, yeah, let's do that. So here's my uh, setup at the moment. Uh, I'm going to go into a bit of detail about things that I've done with this in the past and what I'm currently doing with it now. So I'm basically using the keyboard as a MIDI controller to control a sampler on a computer. Now, back at TechFest, I used a different uh, sampler, something uh, made by Slate, uh, Slate Drums, uh, SSD4, but it had a bunch of problems with it. I mean, the whole thing was panicked as heck anyway, but like, it had this really horrible, like, oh god, is this gonna work? Because, like, I couldn't even get, like, a kick drum on C and D. The only way to get that in that software was to create a whole nother. Slate drums with the kick drum on B, a whole other plugin, and then just kind of merge the two audio outputs into one. So that was horrible. Like, okay, cool software, has its uses, great for electronic stuff, um, but when it comes to just trying to have some fun, I wish that, um, I wish I'd had get my own, like a computer of my own, because then I would have had Get Good Drums, the Halpen version. Uh, this was the predecessor to this one, which is Get Good Drums Modern and Massive, which is what I'm absolutely loving at the moment. This is literally enabling so much within me because it's just such a sick sound out of the box. Um, no, they don't pay me to say that. Uh, I just, I love those guys. I love the way Matt Halpin hits and I love the way that Nolly tracks. Um, the combination of those two minds, it just really works for me because that Nolly sound is something I've always had in my head anyway. Matt and me, we have a bit of a similar rim shot going on. At least it looks to me as if he's really like following through into the skin. And the thing that uh, that Get Good does, which no other library does really, is that the loudest hit on a normal snare note is that big fat rim shot. And I can just hear that. So, in a tech vest setting, had I had this, how I would have worked this out was... Okay, in a, in a DAW, we have many more outputs than we would use live. So I've got like here, we've got like a kick drum in, a kick drum sub, and then like a snare top, a snare bottom, and then toms individually. But what I had at TechFest was I needed an output, an interface with only like, I don't know, 
I think I had eight outputs to work with. So we decided to go for like output one would just be kicks together, output two would just be snares, snare top and bottom mixed, uh, outputs three, four, and five for toms, potentially, and then like six for hi hats, and then seven and eight for overheads. Um, no need for rooms when you're on a stage, because like, you know, that's all this stuff is just gonna, if you're in a big room. That's the venue already, so like, essentially, the sound guy would get the overheads, like... They would get that, they would then get, you know, hi-hats just down the one channel. And then that way, when they're mixing, like they would mix an actual drum kit, they can actually, the sound guy has a chance to craft in each uh, input separately, you know, the kick drum can be worked as a kick drum, the snare can be worked as a snare. Now, of course, it's one thing to just say, hey, any drummer can just get on a keyboard and do this. There's so much finger dexterity involved, and I'm just really grateful that I spent so long when I was younger learning how to play piano, because I've got great finger dexterity just kind of built in. I mean, I forgot it all when I focused on drums, but with my injuries, especially like the time out with the shoulder before, I just I had to keep active, so I just... <laughs> had to keep practicing this damn thing. Um, first time I saw this instrument being used this way was uh, Paul Lothis, the legend that is Chimp Spanner. He, um, he just really knew how to play this stuff like off the bat and I always was amazed by the fact I could see him. I just I thought that was completely impossible but it's not it's it's not rocket science it just like all instruments it just takes practice. So let's talk about mapping. I love getting into mapping talk about drums first. So a keyboard has a sprung action on a key. You're not gonna, like, this isn't gonna work. For me, that's not, that's not smooth. So our two keys for my kick are gonna be C and B. Luckily, lots of things are just, you know, they work like that anyway. Um, same for the snare. I just really like to have that set up constantly there. I have a side stick there. And I'm still not sure about this. I'm not sure what else I want. Actually, a rough would be great to have there. So I'm just going to throw that on. So yeah, that's a new thing. I've now got that there. I wasn't sure what to do with that key, but you know, it's sitting there. You know, so here's snare world. Side stick. Two main snares, identical. Because, you know, right and left samples will be alternating probably most of the time inside the, the sampler logic. Um, toms. I have this set up for three toms with two keys on each. So, for floor tom, second tom, first tom. That's just because I like... I'm just used to it being from, like, high to low. I, I did think of it like it was a kit for a while, where this was like... Dun, dun, you know what, I never really tried that. I'm gonna give that a go. Um, and luckily this this is, plugin's just great for like working this stuff out really quick. So I can just literally press two keys. I click on learn, I go key one, key two. And you just see it appear there. So now. So maybe that is a better way, but you know, anyway, I'm going to flip that back for the sake of my programming. Hi-hats. So instead of how general MIDI, like a normal keyboard drum setup is going to have you set up, it's like I've got hi-hat closed on F sharp one. And instead of having the pedal here, that didn't make sense to me. That's like a half open, something that's like getting a bit bigger and I've got something open here. It's not like fully open. For now I'm just okay with that being kind of like... Because my open usually is a bit chunky and all over the place when I'm playing. So what I've done is I've mirrored these three down here. The reason for that is if I'm ever like trying to program without um, without kicks, which I sometimes do, That way I've actually got two hands. 
then I put my uh, pedal hats down here because I can't play them at the same time. Like this is just too much. This whole four finger independence thing is not happening. So I program these afterwards always. Um, that's never gonna happen in the real world. So I've got closed pedal and then that's our, um, I don't know. I think these guys are called it Ching. I guess that makes sense, but I call it like a foot splash, you know, just hit the back of the hi-hat pedal with your heel. So they're there, if I ever want that. We've got ride, the, the way I like to set up a ride is normal ride, um, crashing the ride on E, and then bell here. These are, that's basically GM, like some people set it up differently, but that's... Some mappings have a China there, that didn't really make sense, like ride China, ride not much sense in there, but this. Backtracking to the snare, the best thing about this thing is that the snare can just be, it just feels very playable, but the thing is, they've included custom envelopes just for individual instruments. So if I want my snare, I wouldn't want it like this, because this is me tickling it. What I usually will want is to bring this all the way back and then... And then that way... I don't know if you can see how much I'm hitting it. Whereas at a normal curve... That feels good to me, but I might just back it off sometimes one bit. It means I can get quieter notes out more easily. So sometimes I'll just do that on a global pattern, then that's every instrument. But I don't really like my kick to be like that. Usually I'll do like, kick will actually be easier. I don't know, maybe we'll keep that like as it is. We'll just stick to a global, a global, because it's working. But the, it's great that that's there, so that if we ever wanted it. And now I'll talk about the rest of the symbols. Now, I'm thinking of this area as the actual top of my kit. So you can see that there's my left crash is here, my right crash is here. So that's actually like where they are. And then my china to the right of that. So I'm thinking of these as like my higher tier symbols, you know, the higher ones. And then the right has its own thing because of its multiple things. But the splash is sitting on the G here because it's like lower tier, it's, it feels like it's lower. So that's my layout. There's nothing more to it. That's there's nothing else. Well, okay. There's another hi hat there. I'm not sure why, but anyway, doesn't matter. That's all I use. So as you can hear, out the box, sounds huge, and off you go. You're having fun. Like I'm, I'm having fun anyway. Part of the reason why I'm having such a good time with it is because of this turbo knob that's built into it um, to demonstrate what the turbo knob does. It essentially seems to add like a, a really nice envelope shapey. I'll take off my compressor because I was boosting it up a bit more. Uh, here's, here's the snare top mic. And here's it without turbo. See, that's kind of what the sample sounds like raw. Which is kind of uninspiring in the mix. If I show you what that sounds like in the mix with no, without that turbo. The transient, the pop of the snare is kind of gone. I'll turn it on. Here, how it just kind of is now sharp. And then I put on my own compressor on top of it. Just to, that's just FabFilter Pro C, and that's just, um, go away. No one likes you, G Force overlay. It's just getting a bit of attack here, like about 30 milliseconds of attack without, with, without. A little bit of smack. Just makes me feel like things are happening. There's only a bit of compression going on over the whole mix. This is like a mid side. Fab filter stuff is fantastic for that without it.
I always I found myself mixing into some kind of compression limiting. I did have a limiter going on on this project, but uh, it was just not working. So, yeah, there's that. It was just a... I think this computer's a bit old and it, latency was uh, not good. So that's my, uh, that's my note mapping. Other things that this plugin is great for is the fact that there's great bleed control. I find that, you know, being able to actually control the amount of bleed that's going into an instrument, you know. I like my snare bottom to hear a little bit of a little bit of kick in there. Sometimes if I'm compressing it really hard, I might actually want to hear that really loud in it. I really like that buzz sitting at the bottom sometimes. And in a real miking situation, you're having to work out rejection points on microphones. It's a nightmare. So just having one button access to that, that's for kicks, toms, and cymbals. That's all through the snare. Um, there's no other bleed controls. It's amazing. They already knew that really wasn't needed. Cymbal choice is great in here. Everything sounds really nice. One thing I did do... Um, this is a reminder of issues that I used to have with guys when we had a big room and the cymbals are just too loud and we really wanted to have really just want to have the snare and toms and the kick, just the drums see that's me playing with the cymbals see what that sounds like when I actually bring the room mono into that mic See, when that's being pumped in a mix, I really like it when that's not happening. Especially, I'll, I'll demonstrate that with a bit more compression on that. I'm just going crazy with this to like overly demonstrate a point. I might sometimes want to use that as an effect. Like, See how messy that is? Okay, yes, the kick is, it's overly squeezed, the kick is getting, you know, it's, it's maxing out, but. But I can pull the cymbals out of that mic, here. Minus the fact it's too loud. Like, to me that sounds great. Pull up the, pull up the room mono mic, the cymbals in that mic. I don't know, I find it messy, so I keep that out. That's like, but it's letting me play the room like I'd like to play it, which I really appreciate, and I know that, you know, other producers would love. Uh, lots of drums to choose from. Well, one of the things that I really like about this is it's kind of just let me play, and that's and just come up with new ideas and write some music. So something I've been working on a little bit here, I've got a bunch of riffs from this, uh, that I've got some other instruments that I'll show off another time uh, by Solemn Tones, Odin and Loki, like program guitars and bass. I've currently got them frozen just so I can focus on one instrument on my processor while I'm uh, working this kind of stuff out. Some of these drums I've written a bit, I've kind of played in some stuff, or something like that, and then I could actually come out with a riff as a result of it. This is one riff that came out like that. So it's kind of started off being something that I've been playing and then it's ended up being something that I've actually programmed to high heaven. I've always found myself more comfortable programming with a piano roll because I like to control note lengths. It means that I can, it means I can make like, let's say I'm working on a, you can see where I've played it because these are all different lengths and different velocities. Uh, but it maybe I'm trying, uh, maybe I'm programming like a symbol. If I do it to a full length, I can just hit the duplicate button and it will come out where I want it. So that would sound like... But if I wanted that to be 
a shorter subdivision, I just know to draw it shorter and then duplicate it. So that's just working really well for me, but Cubase MIDI editing is, you know, there's no secret that that's bloody cool. Thanks so much for tuning in and checking this all out. I know it's been a bit wordy and a bit technical, but um, yeah, this is you know what I've been doing and what I'm going to continue to do. The idea is that I'm going to revisit this as like a second episode when I've actually regained my ability to play. And um, this track that you were listening to, maybe that's become something a little bit more, you know, but I'll be talking about, you know, how I use this all as pre-production to actually, you know, play the stuff and then probably do a bit of a playthrough of that you know that but that's in the future you know we're in uh, we're in November 2018 now I don't know how long it's going to be until I can actually get back on the kit so I guess when I do that video that's when you know that I'm uh, back on business on the kit but thanks so much for tuning in um, please do hit a like and uh, if you want to see more stuff like this from me, you know, that I have a subscribe button, it exists. I'm not telling you to press it, but you can totally press it if you want to check out more stuff. Apparently there's a little bell that will tell you when I'm, you know, releasing stuff that will give you notifications. I don't really mind. I think the most important thing is, is that I really want to actually talk more, connect more with you guys who've supported me for a very long time through many different bands. I'm now out on my own doing my own thing. And I've got loads of really cool stuff that I'm, you know, going to be working on. I'd love to share that with you. If you're interested in all of that, then you know what to do. If not, then no problem at all. You know, stay for what you'd like. And if you just came here for the drum videos for or Metal Bruce Almighty, then, uh, you know, fair enough. Enjoy that. But uh, there's going to be a little bit more of this kind of tutorial-y, storytelly sort of stuff. And I um, hope you enjoy all of it. So... Take care, have a good day, be well, and I'll see you next time.